Hello, I am Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. ASEC is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have Dr. Richard Shaughnessy joining us today for this webinar entitled Defining Clean in School Facilities and Its Impact on Students. Dr. Shaughnessy currently serves as the Program Manager for the Center for Environmental Research and Technology at the University of Tulsa. In addition, he has received numerous awards and appointments for his dedication to the overall field of indoor air quality. Dr. Shaughnessy has also published numerous pieces of research specifically highlighting school indoor air quality. Welcome, Dr. Shaughnessy. Thank you for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Today I'm going to talk to you briefly about the importance of uh, defining, defining clean in schools, and what that means in terms of impact related to the students themselves. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge my co-investigators. What I'm going to do is tend to introduce uh, the issues related to schools, why we should be more concerned or interested in these aspects of the indoor environment, and then I'm going to talk about research and co-investigators being Dr. Jean Cole from Brigham Young and Dr. Ula Haveternan from the um, National Institute of Public Health in uh, Kuopio. Churchill, Churchill once said, and I, I, I really like this, uh, first, uh, first we shape our dwellings, then our dwellings shape us. And I, and I think that's very true. I mean, whatever we invest in our, in our buildings, there is a return. And, and how much we invest will be a determinant as well as what we get back. For many reasons, I travel internationally and I um, am able to visit and study schools in other countries. I wanted to show you just briefly here, I mean, we're looking at schools from Finland that uh, are exceptional in terms of how they build them, how they maintain them, the the attention paid to the schools themselves, there are paybacks associated with that. Part of the thing, some of the things that are important related to schools and that I see in Scandinavian countries uh, already built into the schools are things such as daylighting, uh, the lack of clutter. The lack of clutter is very important. And also, we understand that clutter um, represents allergen collectors and other problems associated with it as well. So it, it, kind of taking those things into account, I think the ideal class, it's spacious, has a track off uh, where you're preventing the pollutant from coming into the building. 80% of dirt and particulate matter we find in a building, we actually bring in on our shoes. Daylighting is very important, as I've already mentioned. Adequate ventilation, it's fundamental fundamental provision must be looked toward related to an acceptable indoor environment and ensuring that the uh, building is, the classroom in itself is uh, clean and cleanable. I think uh, those two have to go hand in hand. Yet here in the United States, I wouldn't call this the exception. Um, I wouldn't call it the norm, but unfortunately, we're dealing with many problems here, and um, much of that is financial related. So I wouldn't call it indif indifference. Uh, I don't know if it's a lack of recognition of the importance of uh, good uh, indoor environments related to learning. Fundamental provisions such as ventilation are being lost in the equation. But with all of this, the lost revenue to the district, the ignoring of basic provisions for health of the student population is something that we can no longer ignore because there are financial returns related to that. I mean, we're paying a price for that. Uh, the clutter factor in buildings is significant in our schools. So I guess after 25 years of working in schools and working on behalf of the EPA as best I can, supporting their Tools for Schools program, I, I found that administrators in schools certainly appreciate the information related to indoor air. But in addition to that, 
they need critical documentation to justify investments. In other words, if they're going to invest in improved indoor environments, there needs to be a tangible payback to that. And by tangible payback, I'm looking at, I'm talking about improved health, I'm talking about student performance, and these are some of the aspects that we always ultimately look toward related to our studies in schools. Now, what kind of problems do we have that result in financial losses to schools? Well, clearly, when schools shut down, there are losses. Um, the norovirus outbreak just, just this year exceeded one million globally, but in the U.S., just reported, and I'm talking about reported cases, we had more than 250 cases of um, uh, the stomach flu uh, going about, and uh, that's significant in terms of the impact on schools being able to operate on a daily basis. You combine that with the flu, and schools having to completely close down is a function of uh, flu running rampant throughout the building, very much a problem. And then you, you factor that in, flu season, children transmitting this one to the other by contact and by air, lack of ventilation within this space, everyone breathing the same air. This is, uh, again, very much a problem. You take that into account, and here we have a significant cost where average schools, a district will lose 40 to $50 per day when a student is absent, not in that desk on that given day. Other things to consider have to do with performance. Uh, contaminated schools may lower kids' IQ. We published extensively on this uh, related to one aspect of the environment being ventilation. Ventilation, again, a very basic fundamental provision if we're going to achieve acceptable air quality. And we found with the lack of ventilation, there is a correlation to lower test scores. And uh, we found this in two different studies. We have new uh, research uh, that we're now reviewing all the data, and we're going to be publishing on that as well. We look at reading scores internationally in mathematics, and we look at science here. Look how Finland ranks, number three, number six, uh, number two. Yet the investment they put in to the schools per child is much less than what we put in the U.S. It, it's how they go about dealing with the students, the importance of education, and the importance of the environment as well. Now you compare Finland here to the United States and, and to the other countries as well. The United States. 17th in reading, 31st here, related to uh, mathematics, 20 th 23rd related to science. I mean, this is unacceptable. I mean, we should be doing better, and the environment certainly factors into that. Teacher absence as well is very important. A recent report indicated that one out of three teachers miss, uh, are absent from school uh, greater than 10 times per year. And these costs associated with teachers uh, having to come in and fill the, fill the role of the missing teachers at that point, uh, total to greater than $4 billion annually. So these substitute teachers uh, and the cost associated with that is significant. So which brings us back to our topic today and how does clean play a role in this? How, what impact does that have? Well, if you look at the definition of clean, we have free from dirt or pollution or free from contamination or disease. When we look at the cleaners we typically use in schools, number one, they may be substandard. Number two, substandard not being effective. Number two, they may emit many organics into the air that are problematic for the children. Here we're looking at a scan, and every peak represents a different compound within one cleaner that we have here. And if we look at the makeup of the volatile organics within cleaning products, we have a certain percentage of these that are, in fact, carcinogens. Uh, others are irritants, and, and we have reproductive concerns as well. So we need to be paying attention, number one, to the types of cleaning products we're using in schools, which brings us to the subject of green cleaning supplies. What do we mean by that? Well, what we believe it to mean is that there will be a reduced health hazard lower toxicity, uh, improved impact related to indoor air quality, recyclable uh, alternatives having lower volatile organic emissions, reduced water and soil pollution related to the supplies themselves, 
uh, some being vegetable-based as opposed to chemical-laden materials. And uh, this is significant. This is important uh, that we understand, number one, that conventional cleaners do release more VOCs into the air as compared to green cleaners. And many of these VOCs are suspected endocrine disruptors, which are very much a concern as we learn more and more about these. Keeping in mind that so green cleaners, all green cleaners are not fail safe. Some contain compounds of risk to children's health. And we also have to remember where a compound may be green, is it effective? And the term green and clean should be compatible. So the efficacy of the product is very important as well to achieve a desired cleaning, uh, cleaning result. Endocrine disrupting comp uh, compounds that I just talked about, we find these just everywhere in the environment. Baby products, paints, uh, flooring products, fragrances, pesticides, and cleaning agents is what we have here and specific to what we're talking about today. The importance of endocrine disrupting compounds is, is the fact that these, here we have a natural hormone, and the, what we have down here surrounding it are other compounds which mimic the natural hormone. And in mimicking that, the body then, we have the hormone in the body going to the receptor in the body, and then we have the endocrine disruptor uh, being unable to distinguish between the hormone and the endocrine disruptor. It then sends a, a different signal to the receptor. And that receptor is uh, that how uh, that may play out. There are a number of things in terms of reproductive, in terms of general health, growth and development, uh, behavioral. Uh, I, I mean, it, it gets down to our most basic uh, makeup of who we are. And we much more attention is being paid to this now and should be uh, paid to it as we move forward in the future. The concern, well, the ubiquity of these products and everything that we have, metal can linings and food linings and uh, cleaning products and paints and flooring products and uh, water, uh, baby, baby bottle products, and the cleaning agents as well is significant. And the, what we've learning in recent years related to these products are there are outcomes such as asthma, reproductive concerns, Can cancer, autism, diabetes, obesity. Um, so again, this is a rapidly evolving area of research where we're learning more and more uh, about the impact of these endocrine disruptors and trying to identify them to eliminate or reduce them in the products that we use on a daily basis. And with all of the cleaning products that we have on the market, there is a concern and you have to wonder what what is green? What, it, what does that essentially mean? Well, we've talked about what a green cleaning product should be, but how do we know, in fact, that a product on a shelf is in, well, what, what it's being marketed for as a green product, which is better for the environment, lower VOCs, and everything else I'll mention. In 2010, a report came out which talked, uh, in fact, indicated that more than 32% of green products on the market carry a fake green label. So the Federal Trade Commission, the former FTC chairman, recently said environmentally friendly products are certainly beneficial, but marketers' claims must be truthful and substantiated. Uh, the FTC put out guidelines in 2012 where general principles that apply to uh, environmental marketing claims should be followed. And they're t they talk about the unqualified use of terms like green and eco-friendly. They, the claim should be more specific and clear with respect to the environmental benefits. Uh, the impact of cleaning for health, here again, intuitively we believe reduced absenteeism, improved health, improved performance, and reduced medical costs. Schools, definitely we have a challenge in every facet that we work with, and they're limited uh, financially and uh, with uh, personnel. Uh, limited uh, maintenance, janitorial staff, outdated cleaning equipment, exaggerated claims as to cleaning products, which, which cleaning products should one use. And there's no direct information on cleaning. What is clean in a school? How do we gauge that? How do we select the right product and so on? Cleaning research has indicated that visual assessment is not a reliable indicator of surface cleanliness, cleanliness or of cleaning efficacy. So that visual, that white glove test, you know, that we think of in the past, 
may not be as effective as we thought to determine uh, well, what's there that we can't see. And that may be just as important and more important than, say, the subtle dust that we have on the surface. Bugs get transferred in a number of ways. I mean, we have uh, children, small children, putting their fingers in their mouth once every three minutes. And then children up to six years average uh, frequency of 9.5 uh, contacts per hour. And then you have to wonder where, where have those fingers been and, uh, and then where do they get passed on to? And this is important. Of course, they get passed on as such as we touch, uh, shake hands, uh, move about, and, and, and transfer to surfaces, and then surfaces back to other people. Here we, we're looking at a magnified shot of a very small crevice on a surface. And within that crevice itself, uh, we have, on the order of just a few microns, many different types of bacteria and other uh, contaminants, biocontaminants that can accumulate within that space. Here we're looking at a very small etch on a surface and what's, uh, what's ingrained in that as well and what can grow in that and survive there for a, uh, an extended period of time such that contact being made can be picked up and passed on to others as well. The CDC in 2011-2012 said that routine cleaning school staff should routinely clean areas that students and staff touch often with the cleaners they typically use. Recent research shows that, uh, that enhanced hygiene, targeted cleaning of frequent contact points, uh, reduced illness, uh, is, is tied in to reduced illness related to bacterial reservoirs, uh, reduced sick building syndrome symptoms, reduced absenteeism due to infectious illness. What we, through the past six plus years, we've been working to try to look at different cleaning markers. And um, uh, ATP is a marker for biomass within a space. And if we, we look at that on residual surfaces, it also becomes an estimation of contaminant load in hospitals and food industries that's been used for some period of time. The important thing, it's rapid, it's portable, it's affordable, it's a good marker for cleanliness in general. So we've looked at that and conducted considerable research throughout the United States um, where we've looked at uh, five regions of the U.S. greater than 10,000 ATP samples uh, as a gauge for that biocontamination on surfaces to develop, the end point was to develop a baseline of what is clean in schools which may help to establish some consensus standards of care. We recently have published that and um, I have a reference at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation you could go to. But I believe it's online now and in fact it will be in print in June 2013, but it talks about ATP as a marker for surface contamination of biological origin in schools. And essentially it provides information on the baseline of how you might want to gauge what is clean, what is substandard, um, a benchmark, a metric, if you will, for use in the future to try to improve cleaning in schools. What we looked at in our study, we looked at classroom desks. Uh, we did repeated measurements pre-cleaning, post-cleaning. Uh, we did it on ca uh, cafeteria tables. We did it in bathroom stall doors and sinks around areas. When we did find, uh, whereas we looked at ATP, we also took bacteria measurements as well. And we were encouraged to find that the reduction in ATP very much correlated with the reduction in bacteria within the space. So again, a good marker at least for not only cleanliness, but gives you some idea of if when we're cleaning, also the reduction in terms of biocontamination of the surface. We went to four additional regions of the, U of the United States to validate whether or not that baseline is, um, uh, is appropriate or can be used representative in other parts of the country. Uh, we took an additional 3,800 measurements, uh, used the same protocol from the baseline collection effort that we did initially. And from that, we're looking at data here. What we have here is the initial set of data pre 
and post. Then we have in uh, another part, the first uh, area was Texas. Then we went to Massachusetts, Michigan, North Carolina, and Utah. And you see similar types of pre-cleaning levels that you would find and similar post-cleaning, depending upon how well the surface would be clean. But again, this is encouraging. It supports the database that we put together that can be used as perhaps a metric in the future. So the first, uh, I, I guess in looking at our data right now, uh, we're encouraged that the ATP levels in the uh, ranges of cleaning or what is clean, what is not clean, and so on, has been validated as representative across other parts of the United States, different climates, different regions as a whole. Uh, the second thing, which I very much think is important, is that we generate numbers related to cleaning, but ultimately, ultimately, how does this relate to children's health? This is much more complicated, as you might imagine. But from the initial data set, we took three separate data sets and we looked at health data from school nurses, we looked at background information for, on the fifth grade students, and of course the ATP readings. And we did find significant correlations of gastrointestinal, abdominal pain, stomach ache, headaches, uh, cough, sore throat, right on down the line with the ATP levels. So again, the information was useful in that there are correlations we're beginning to see between the level of cleanliness and the health symptoms, but I must say that much more detailed analyses are needed and a larger population. Uh, we're currently in another study looking at a large district with a number of schools control and study schools, and we're gathering health information and we're trying again to get to that end point difficult to do, it's costly, the research, many confounders as you might imagine, but we're working through it and that health endpoint has to be there at the end of the day if we're going to justify that improvement in schools, better cleaning, what do I get back for it again, which is what we started with in this talk at the beginning. What can be used as a simple marker in schools for clean? With that, they're now developing a clean standard. The primary goal of the standard is to provide schools with a tool that will help them objectively measure and monitor the level of cleanliness at their facilities. But again, I, all of this is good and it's uh, wonderful to have a standard, and, uh, but all of it must come back to the health and learning ability and how that impacts the student, which is our end, end point related to our research. Uh, the clean standard is due out in 2013. I, I was at a conference recently and I really, had somebody brought this quote up, if we don't change the direction of where we are going, we will end up where we are headed. And if you think about it, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of sense in that, in that we, we truly need to reconsider where we're headed, what, what direction we're going, and, and perhaps change that endpoint based on what we know, what we're learning at this point in time. And that goes for schools. So we've learned so much in the past 10 to 20 years of the importance of proper ventilation, proper cleaning, proper reduction of uh, clutter, the, the, the hygiene within the schools, uh, animals in schools. I mean, we're, we've learned so much and we need to put that into effect. We need to change as a function of what we've learned. And I, I'm optimistic that will occur and is occurring slowly as we also understand the benefits that come along with those improvements in terms of financial benefits, real tangible benefits for schools in the future. Uh, additional resources uh, are here listed for you as well. And uh, again, with uh, all that said, uh, I uh, appreciate your time and uh, we're, have some questions. Um, so at this point, I wanted uh, to announce that uh, participants can send questions via the text chat, which is an option located at the top on the toolbar. The first one being what, uh, what specific best practices do you recommend for schools to improve their facilities cleanliness? That's a great question. I'm not I'm not sure who submitted that, um, but I can tell you this, that so far at this point in time, we focused on trying to determine 
what levels of cleanliness there are in schools. Uh, and by that I mean we're trying to gauge what is the typical school in terms of level of surface biocontamination, pre-cleaning, post-cleaning, what is that? And, and in our study we used a reasonable degree of cleaning in there. So reasonable uh, in terms of what might typically occur within a school. We in fact only got a 90% reduction on, on the level of cleanliness when we use that approach. But uh, with all that said, uh, to answer your question, I think there are many, many different methods in terms of cleaning that are out there. We are not testing different types of cleaning um, uh, practices per se. We're sim simply right now looking at the endpoints. There are a number of ways to get to that. Some of that I'm sure are going to be built into the clean standard eventually, but right now um, the best I could say is we're looking at the levels of cleanliness and what typically is there and we're trying to relate that to health and of course ultimately is well that's going to parallel that are improved cleaning processes. Looking for another question here, uh, what do we know about the use of whiteboard markers in the classrooms? I can't really answer too much on that. I mean there are uh, different types of markers that are available that in fact do not have uh, significant volatile organics in them. Some of the first uh, whiteboard markers that came out, you could open one at the front of the class and uh, by diffusion alone, you'd be smelling it in, in the back of the class uh, within a matter of uh, seconds. So, but there have been significant improvements in markers available and uh, alternative products uh, that should be looked for when you're looking for a whiteboard marker. Um, here's another question. How does your research correlate to the issue of superbugs as a result of overuse of antibacterial agents? What, what's being referred to here is something called the hygiene, hygiene hypothesis. And that hypothesis is that some degree of introduction of contaminants into a child's early years and their exposure to that may in fact help them to build their immunity system later in life. Along with that is the idea that as we clean, as we try and turn our normal environment into a healthcare type environment, like a sterile environment, we may in fact be uh, creating these superbugs because we know that microbes mutate. I guess my answer to that is um, to stay tuned, but I, I, uh, because there is more research related to the hygiene hypothesis. If you email me, I could send you a recent report that came out from the UK, which does not put much stock into the hygiene hypothesis. And the fact is, is that um, schools as a whole are, I mean, we aren't even close to getting to the concern uh, to that level of concern that <laughs> it, 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 we're, we're creating a sterile environment. Uh, for the most part, uh, schools, because of lack of funding and what, are not able to be maintained to the level, to the degree that they should. So it's something to, to keep track of and to watch, but I don't think that uh, in this case, by what we're talking about in cleaning, we're getting to that point where we have to con uh, be concerned about overcleaning. Uh, we have a long ways to before we get there and there is much research on the hygiene hypothesis that uh, is questionable and, and uh, uh, certainly uh, the cleaning methods that we have in place now aren't going to be a problem related to that at this point in time. Another question, um, what can a teacher do? The top five things. <laughs> to impact the clean level in his or her classroom? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I'd have to think about that, uh, but um, I, I think what comes to mind right off is, uh, is uh, definitely uh, recognizing the importance of different sources within the classroom. Uh, I mean, uh, we shouldn't be burning candles or having incense. We shouldn't have animals in the classroom. Uh, we should, the lack, uh, well, we should decrease the level of clutter in any way that we can. 
look to the different cleaning products that you're using and make sure they're compatible with, that, with what the school has recommended. Um, and, uh, and, and these cleaning products as a whole should be green cleaning products that are certified. And there's so much more to do in the classroom. I guess we could spend an after afternoon on that. Ventilation is very important. You should ensure it's working properly. And if you have a unit ventilator on the side, don't put books on that because you're obstructing airflow into the classroom. I'm going to have to move on to another question, though. Is ATP available to schools to integrate into their own custodial program? Um, ATP monitors uh, do cost somewhere on the order of a few thousand dollars at this point in time. However, the cost for a district for one ATP monitor should be payback associated with being able to do these measurements. In fact, the measurement is very simple. It costs no more than one to two dollars to do an ATP measurement. Uh, you could do it in a matter of seconds and uh, you get uh, an idea of cleaning levels related to that. So yes, it can be built into custodian program, custodial programs. No, an ATP meter does not to be, uh, need to be incorporated into every school, but a district investment in an ATP monitor is affordable and useful as a whole related to uh, gauging cl cleanliness in the school itself. And uh, another question, um, Patrick asks, uh, trying to use Green Seal certified products in a school district has been successful in terms of efficacy. However, the ability to disinfect touch points, particularly, particularly in restroom and cafeteria environments, leads to us needing to use quaternary ammonium products, which are EPA classified as pesticides, uh, presenting other health issues. Are there no other chemicals or techniques that provide a similar efficacy? You know, quaternary ammonium products are used quite a bit to disinfect in certain areas of buildings. I believe there are alternatives, and what I would rather refer you to is uh, someone like Marilyn Black uh, at UL uh, or the Green Guard Institute. They could talk to you more about this. Another question uh, Robert asked, uh, have you looked into five levels of cleaning from the APPA custodial guidelines for educational facilities? Um, this is actually related to the work that CIRI has been doing, and uh, I, I have not uh, been in, uh, so closely involved with the actual um, cleaning techniques and how they're going about it. What we're looking at are just the cleaning levels themselves within the, within the schools and how those relate to health. Again, um, it, this isn't prescriptive. I, I think the clean standard will be more related to trying to meet a desired level of cleaning, but not being prescriptive into how you meet that. Barbara asked, how effective is induct UV light for infection control? You know, it's been known for years um, to be important in healthcare scenarios. Do we need it in schools? I don't. I don't know. I, we've done a lot of research on ultraviolet irradiation. Do we need it in schools? That's probably a good question. I think it's somewhat overkill as a whole uh, in school environments. It may not, it, it's not going to do harm, but uh, at the same time, it should not give a false sense of security that I can now reduce my level of maintenance within the school itself. And UV is, has been shown to be effective for bacteria not so effective for fungal agents and only certain types of bacteria, vegetative bacteria, which is one a case being tuberculosis, which is why UV was initially uh, introduced into healthcare as a whole. One other question, uh, Pam asked, most schools do not have nurses and certainly rarely do they get into a classroom. The teacher has to be knowledgeable and act to keep room and other spaces clean. How does one know when the room or facility has good ventilation? I want to know if there's a practical rather than expensive way to determine this. Let me answer that in two ways. I, I certainly believe that schools have a role. The maintenance and custodial staff has a role. 
in keeping, uh, improving the indoor environment, but the occupants and teachers play a major role parallel to that. And you, I completely agree with the question, Pam, uh, about and the, the statement that the teachers must be knowledgeable and they must and and a lot of it is just informing and educating and communicating so much of that is important we have science that often is not translated into the practice so i agree you know there must be an educational component with this if there's a clean standard to be developed I strongly believe there needs to be education associated with that as well, so it will be useful. Um, in terms of the ventilation, there are way, quick and simple ways to check ventilation. Uh, you might, one, determine whether or not your system has is operating properly as best you can. Is air coming out of the supply grills? Is air going into a return? Um, You'd like to know if the outdoor air dampers are, are functioning, but that's not something I would expect a teacher to have to go to look toward. But for facility people, this is second hand, second nature. They should know about the outdoor air supply. They should know whether it's being provided. And a simple way to look at it, uh, inexpensive way, as opposed to doing um, more detailed measurements is like carbon dioxide. The degree of carbon dioxide buildup within a classroom is an indicator of how much ventilation there is. Now, with that said, there are many caveats to that that you have to be very careful in using that. And uh, done a lot of education related to the proper use of carbon dioxide, but as a simple surrogate for ventilation, uh, it's something easy to measure and you get a rule of thumb measurement that can be used to gauge Am I getting some outdoor air into the classroom and how much? Sue asked, what research have you done to measure particulate output from vacuum cleaners? Do you recommend any models over others? Uh, we may personally have not done um, uh, work on vacuum cleaners, although the, um, there, there are other uh, universities that have done, have done a great great amount of work on that. Um, at the University of Cincinnati, I believe Tina Raponin did some work. I know one of my co-investigators, Jean Cole, has done work on uh, vacuum cleaners at Brigham Young University. So if Jean Cole can lead you in, uh, into that uh, realm better than I could. There are papers that he has associated with that. And uh, so, and, and there is actually, um, a green label related to carpets and adhesives and vacuum cleaners as well uh, that's now um, developed by the industry themselves that uh, talks about um, what vacuum cleaners are more appropriate or what can be used, uh, what products are more appropriate. I, again, I would defer that question more to Gene Cole and he might be able to lead you in that direction. So if you email me that, Sue, I can uh, send that on to him. And final question. Tom asked, did you test any technologies in the restroom like spray and vac or spray and squeegee? No, Tom, we didn't. Um, we and, and again, this goes back to the question earlier, what we did in our studies and how we went about doing that. It certainly is the next question to be answered now that we understand what reasonable levels are. Uh, in schools pre and post cleaning, how do we improve upon that? So um, we'll be doing that in the future, looking to continue that type of work. And I, I'm, I'm open to any suggestions you might have in looking into that, but the idea of the squeegee and simple things such as that can be so much more effective in the cleaning. Um, that that will help a lot to making the clean standard more useful in the future as a whole. So with that said, I, I, I appreciate you all tuning in for a short time. And um, at this point, I need to sign off and, uh, and you know how to contact me. I hope you uh, have my email and, uh, and, there, and stay tuned. There'll be a lot more information coming out on these types of topics and the EPA is a, it's a wealth of information related to their Tools for Schools program. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Richard Shaughnessy, and our participants for joining our webinar today.
We hope that you took this opportunity to learn from the content presented, engaged with the speaker, and will use this content to advance your professional knowledge on issues related to school indoor air quality. Please join us again soon for upcoming ASEF events. Remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please call if the ASEF staff can assist you in any way. Have a great day.